there's a beauty in horror. The seductive nature of something terrifying. And nowhere is that more present than in the design of H.R. Giger's Alien, a film icon as influential as Dracula that brought an elegance to the grotesque and reshaped the way we think of movie monsters. This is Hans Rudolf Giger, known simply as H.R., a Swiss surrealist painter whose roots are in architecture and industrial design. And his work has been described as a twisted combination of the surreal, the mechanical, the sexual, and the macabre. And even if you're not familiar with his work, you certainly know his influence, an aesthetic so unique it's earned its own adjective. It's rare for something so disturbing and darkly sensual to also be commercially appealing. So what's the story? Well, in 1977, director Ridley Scott and screenwriter Dan O'Bannon approached Giger after seeing his work in his book Necronomicon, a collection of Giger's airbrush paintings. This is Necrom number four. It, along with its companion piece, Necrom 5, were used as the basis for the xenomorph design. Scott was so impressed with Giger's work, he insisted on keeping the design faithful to the original painting, interfering as little as possible. His distorted blend of sci-fi and abstract industrialism was perfect for that used future atmosphere they were attempting with the film. And Giger's designs became such an integral part of the production that he was also brought on to shape the entirety of LV-426 and everything within it. Gradually, down the line, I realized it made a lot of sense to have Giger design everything that was to do with the alien. That includes the landscape and the spacecraft, and that everything that, that was earthly, then it would be Michael Seymour and his team, right? And so that made a lot of sense, you know? Two separate brains working on two different worlds. Up until 1979, Horror movie creatures were typically earthbound entities, spiders, sharks, lizard man, fish man, wolf man. But Giger, as an outsider to the film industry, wasn't bound by the common design tropes of the 70s. He was able to create something genuinely alien, a distorted biomechanical reflection of man. Everything we fear about ourselves exaggerated to the point of surrealism. It's very difficult to interpret those airbrush paintings in the three dimensions, which is why they had Giger himself fabricate the majority of the alien sets and costumes. They couldn't just tear apart a jet engine and construct the set out of scrap metal like they did with a Nostromo. Giger's vision is very specific and very uniform. A replication of the painting this accurate could only come from the mind who created it. And Giger, coming from a background in industrial design, crafted everything with a practicality in mind. The alien's elongated head housing the secondary mouth, the breathing apparatus on its back in place of a nose, and of course, something with acidic blood would be encased in an exoskeleton. Which, by the way, was made with real bones, along with condoms for its articulating lips and a human skull in the tip of its head. Yes, a real human skull. And coupled with the idea that it wouldn't only take on the characteristics of its host, but also its environment, allowed it to blend perfectly into the interior of the Nostromo, adding to that claustrophobic terror. But even outside its design, one of the greatest aspects of the alien is the logic in its mechanics. You, as an audience member, can understand everything there is to know about the xenomorph's parasitic lifestyle without the need for expositional dialogue. There's no expert that comes in to explain the origins and the motivations of the creature. The symbol is associated with a pagan deity named Bagul. He consumes the souls of human children. You learn the process visually through the experience of the characters, and every stage of its evolution drives the narrative. And unlike your typical slasher movie antagonist, the alien isn't supernaturally invulnerable. It's got a wonderful defense mechanism. You don't dare kill it. It's just as fragile as anyone else on the ship, but killing it can open a whole new series of life-threatening problems for the characters. So brilliantly, the objective becomes escape. It was Jaws that perfected the art of hiding its creature for dramatic tension. But that was done out of necessity given that the shark was fairly unrealistic and close up. But the xenomorph works in bright light or in darkness and at every angle. It's only seen in glimpses to accentuate its ability to disturb and seduce, because the alien's a monster that you want to see. And honestly, at a certain point, it becomes almost too intriguing to be scary. Ich wollte immer ein, ein, ein sehr, ein, ein schönes Alien haben. Wie soll ich das sagen? Ein ästhetisches, ein Monster ist nicht einfach etwas Widerliches, sondern ein Monster kann seine Schönheiten haben. Es, Es kann sich elegant bewegen, es kann szenig sein. Giger's Alien is one of the most influential creature designs of the 20th century. It's become the crux of an empire of games, movies, comics, and merchandise. And somehow nearly 40 years later, it still has the power to terrify, excite, and arouse in equal measures. It's a creature that to this day has seen no equal, 
and it's one of the most beautifully haunting nightmares ever put to film. When the work was finished on Alien, I thought it would be something special, but I, did, I never know that it will be so important. And, and, and I remember Gordon Carroll saying, you know, you will get famous with this film. And I said, oh my God, I, I wouldn't be so successful probably as with the Alien film, no, as the thing of the uh, people always know me as the, the father of this alien. And, uh, <laughs> it's okay.